Can we get started? Hello? Hello. Hello, welcome. Come on in, have a seat. There are plenty open. Welcome, thank you. Thank you all for joining us today, those of you online and those of you in person here in the room with us for this event from corporations to communities, tipping the balance of power in decision-making about our food. My name is Nicole Pita, and I work at IPES Food. We are the international panel of experts on sustainable food systems. We're an interdisciplinary panel of about 25 members, all leaders in the world of food, from agronomists to sociologists, civil society, and social movement leaders. You'll hear from some today at this event and at other events at this conference. On behalf of IPES Food and our co-organizers of this event, the Land Workers Alliance and the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, we'd like to thank the Oxford Real Farming Conference for having us here to speak with you today. We're here today in this room at this conference because we all share a concern. We're concerned about, we're concerned about compounding crises, about the crisis of ecological destruction, climate breakdown, increasing hunger, and malnutrition. And we know, and we agree, that food system transformation is central to tackle these challenges. But there's disagreement about how to go about that transformation. We hear a lot about finance for innovation, how to change agricultural practices, or how to get consumers to shift their diets. But we don't often hear about power about power imbalances, specifically in the governance of food systems, the decision-making about the future of food. So that's what we're here to talk about today. We're here to say that central in the fight to tackle the global challenges of worsening hunger and malnutrition, climate chaos and ecological destruction, lies the fight for just and democratic food system governance. This event will reveal who really controls agri-food policy decision-making and how, and exposes the growing influence of transnational corporations in these processes. I want to introduce the speakers that you'll hear from today. You'll hear about regional struggles for agroecology and food sovereignty from Africa to here in the UK, and also global struggles in international decision-making spaces. And hopefully, by the end of this event, we'll have painted some potential pathways for action to reclaim food governance from corporations to communities. We'll hear from Dee Woods, who's an award-winning food system leader. She's a member of the Land Workers Alliance and La Via Campesina through the Civil Society and Indigenous Peoples Mechanism. <laughs> I hope everyone gets an applause like that. <laughs> uh, you'll also hear from Milion Villay, who is an expert at IPES Food, but also the co-founder and coordinator of AFSA, the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, a network of networks that advocates for seed and food sovereignty, agroecology, and the rights of smallholder farmers, local communities, and indigenous peoples. Thank you. <laughs> you'll hear from Nikki Yoxel, who is a researcher and grazier from Northeast Scotland. She's head of research at Pasture for Life, and her work centers on agroecological transitions, pasture livestock systems, and agri-wilding. <laughs> but before we hear from these three panelists, we're gonna hear from Nick Jacobs. Nick Jacobs is the director of IPES Food. He's a specialist in agri-food trade and development policy, and he'll kick us off with a keynote presentation covering the findings from a recent report that we published last year at IPES Food called Who's Tipping the Scales about the growing influence of corporations on the decision-making about our food systems. After Nick's presentations, we'll have a discussion with the panel, and then after that, I'll invite all of you to join our conversation. There'll be a microphone running around here and up in the balcony as well, so please join our conversation for those of you that are online, please write in your questions because we have someone tracking them and we'll be taking those as well. So without further ado, I'll hand the floor over to Nick.
Thanks very much, Nicole. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Nicole mentioned, I'm going to be presenting the findings of a report IPES Food produced last year. Um, you see the front cover here, who's tipping the scales. Uh, we have a few copies um, up at the front as well, so if anyone's interested in knowing more after the session, please come grab one and speak to us. Um, if we could move straight on to the next slide, please. Um, the starting point for this report and really a whole series of work that we've been doing over the last couple of years was the UN Food Systems Summit that took place in 2021. Um, and this summit was really a watershed moment, I think, for lots of us in the food movement. This was a moment that really exposed the ability of major corporations to set the agenda in food systems governance. And for us, the starting point of this report was to ask, how did we get to a point where corporations could actually design and effectively dominate a UN summit, uh, sidelining so many other actors in the process? Next slide, please. <laughs> Once is enough. <laughs> um, so how did we get here? I, I'm going to be talking about the various mechanisms we see today through which corporations are influencing and capturing food governance. But to start, we wanted to um, look back, uh, give a brief history of how we got to this point. The timeline on this slide starts in the 1970s, but of course this is a much longer story. Um, and we really need to start at the turn of the century that's when the turn of the, the, the 20th century, when we started to see um, the major agri-food trading companies, major input agri-business firms emerge. These giant firms started to consolidate. And it's interesting to note that even then, there was already a pushback and some attempts to create antitrust policies and to rein in the power of these corporations in the agri-food sector, energy sector, and, and many others. However, over the course of the 20th century, <clears throat> we saw continuing industrialization of agriculture, mergers, consolidation, and leading us to a situation in the post-war where we were left with some very powerful um, agri-food corporations with huge power to, to set the agenda and to dominate markets. Um, in the 1970s, we saw some pushback from governments. This is in a context of environmentalism, um, a context in which um, Global South countries are pushing back, the Lomé Convention, uh, for example, establishing, trying to establish a fairer role um, for, for those countries in global food supply chains. Um, and in this context, we did see the creation of a UN Commission on Transnational Corporations um, and the launch of negotiations toward a code of conduct um, on transnational corporations. So some real attempts to rein in corporate power in the 1970s. However, the story doesn't end so well because uh, we move forward to the 80s and 90s. And in a context of neoliberalism, um, there was pushback against that. First of all, much weaker interpretation of antitrust rules, narrowing antitrust to focus primarily on the impact on consumer prices. So if mergers are, are driving down consumer prices, um, they tend to be waved through. Uh, irrespective of their other impacts on environment, on producers, on livelihoods. Um, in this period, we also saw the emergence of self-regulation, voluntary initiatives, um, for example, the sustainable round tables on soy and palm, uh, palm oil. And these are you know, examples of corporations taking a leading seat at the table, the state moving into the back seat, civil society involved to some extent, but certainly not able to set the agenda. And in this period, we also saw the failure of those negotiations uh, that had started in the 1970s and the discontinuation of that process. Uh, moving forward to the 2000s, we really see the normalization of corporate influence and agenda setting in food governance. Um, we see an explosion of public-private partnerships, including the uh, Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, or AGRA, gain many other prominent um, big money partnerships um, positioned to take a leading role in solving challenges like food security. We, in this period, we also saw um, public institutions turn to the private sector for funding. The FAO is one of them. Uh, also the CGIAR, Global Agricultural Research Network, taking increasing shares of funding from private foundations and private companies. And this is also the period where we see the Millennium Development Goals 
which played a crucial role in centering the fight against hunger and poverty, uh, but also served to establish this new modus operandi where corporations are seen as an essential part of food system governance. Their place at the table is no longer questioned. Um, they're there on the grounds that they can bring funding and technical capacity to bear. They have the presence in the domestic economies of these countries fighting food, security, food insecurity. And, and through this process and through this period, we see the concept of the stakeholder becoming established, this undifferentiated term covering all of those with a stake or interest in food systems, this term that puts corporations on the same level as peasant farming groups and many others um, in, in trying to address these problems. And of course, through this period, we see market, con market power and corporate concentration continuing unabated. Uh, over the last few years, there's been a record number of mergers and acquisitions at all nodes of the agri-food chain. New actors coming in, uh, particularly asset management companies, buying up large shares in agri-food corporations. Um, and vertical, horizontal integration across the, across the chain. So this is really a kind of long, dual process of growing corporate power and market power and weakening regulatory climates. Um, and, and of course, the promotion of corporate-friendly regulatory climates and governance climate. And those two things really combining uh, with the market power, translating into political power. Um, next slide, please. So where does that leave us today? We're now in a world where corporate influence over food system governance has really been normalized. It's been embedded into key structures and modes of thinking. Um, and that's happened at the expense of other actors in food systems who have been gradually sidelined. Um, in this report, we've tried to really identify all the different mechanisms um, of corporate influence, this vast playbook of mechanisms through which corporations can really influence and control food system government, governance. Um, we've split them into the more visible mechanisms, um, visible but not transparent in terms of their goals, and the less visible mechanisms that are occurring behind the scenes. And many of these will be familiar to everyone in the room, but I'll, I'll give a little bit of detail on each of them just to paint this full picture of the extent to which corporations are able to pull the strings in the current context. First of all, multi-stakeholder initiatives. Um, these range from the sustainable round table initiatives I mentioned all the way through to the UN Food Systems Summit that took place in 2021. And I'd like to dwell on that summit for a moment um, because it was such a crucial moment um, in terms of revealing the, the rise of corporate influence and the, and the threats that it now poses. Um, so this is a summit that seemed great on the surface because it was bringing renewed attention to questions of food security and food systems. However, um, it arose from a, a secret memorandum of understanding between the UN and the World Economic Forum, which clearly represents corporate interests. So the whole planning and agenda setting phase completely bypassed um, the established fora and mechanisms for civil society groups and farmer organizations to participate. Then as the summit moved forward <coughs> into the preparatory phases, uh, we saw unstructured ad hoc modes of engagement. And what that means is that those with the most time and the most money on their hands, corporate actors are able to dominate proceedings. Others are scrambling to take part. Some civil society organizations ended up boycotting. Um, others took part in the best way they could while knowing that there were conflicts of interest that had not been resolved. Um, and in terms of the outcomes, this is a summit um, that, that ended up validating a whole range of solutions without having really been able to discuss those solutions with all of those um, involved in them, uh, all of the affected communities. Um, we ended up with outcomes that undermine right-based approaches and are really anathema to the systemic change we need to see. So multi-stakeholder initiatives are top of the list there, and they're a really crucial threat because they're perhaps the one that seems the most transparent but is, but is the most threatening. Um, secondly, public-private partnerships. I mentioned some of these already. Um, they typically involve close link linkages between governments, international organizations, big businesses, and increasingly private foundations. Um, there are many of these now in the food security area. They tend to emerge when food security is top of the agenda. 
Sometimes they're discontinued, but in the meantime, they occupy a lot of attention and suck up a lot of funding. The third mechanism is funding global fora. So um, this one, we've listed it as a visible mechanism, but it's not always so visible. It's certainly not something corporations are always advertising. Um, the FAO is a key example here. It's developed um, partnerships with CropLife, uh, which represents the agrochemical industries. Um, and clearly, these relationships create dependencies, and they give um, special access to corporations in these key um, public governance fora. Then moving on to the less visible mechanisms, what's happening behind the scenes. First of all, corporate concentration. Um, so the influence that corporations have by virtue of this huge market share, um, they, they have now achieved huge concentration of power in key sectors. For example, the farm machinery sector, the top six corporations control 72% of global markets. In the agrochemical sector, the top six control 78% of the market, and this is the dynamic all across the agri-food chain. Um, this level of market power translates into price-setting power, power to shape regulations, power to put barriers to entry, allowing those companies to maintain this stranglehold. Um, the next mechanism is lobbying. Uh, this is a very familiar and long-standing one, um, but it's been increasing. Um, and proliferating in terms of the means of doing it. Um, so in the US, for example, lobbying by, by Big Ag doubled from $79 million per year in 2000 to $150, $150 million per year in 2021. And um, the focus remains on national governments, but uh, corporate lobbying has spread very rapidly into new fora where there's a possibility of influencing food system governance. In COP28, and the previous climate cops before that are prime examples um, of huge lobbying, particularly from the meat, big meat and dairy industries. Um, political donations is another channel. Um, these can be legal donations. There's also many cases of bribes being paid. For example, um, up to $250 million of bribes paid by JBS, the world's biggest meat corporation, to, to politicians in Brazil. Um, finally, um, structural influence over trade and investment agreements. So we started with multi-stakeholder initiatives. Um, this is a kind of visible involvement in, in shaping global food policies, but corporations are also working very intensely behind the scenes uh, to shape regulations and laws, particularly through trade agreements. Um, and through that influence, they've been able to achieve, um, to, to make sure that trade agreements include clauses the ISDS clauses allowing for special dispute settlement in private arbitration, um, and that, that has created um, what's known as a regulatory freeze, where governments are fearful to bring in new regulations they need to bring in for health and environment reasons, but can't do it for fear of being sued by corporations under the terms of these trade agreements. Uh, next slide, please. And just to um, highlight again the point on lobbying, this was just a few weeks ago, um, at COP28, um, we saw record numbers of lobbyists from the, from the dairy and meat industries, um, and that lobbying is, takes the shape of direct interfacing with policymakers. It also takes the shape of narrative forming and bringing terms to the table and shaping the discussions that will take place. Um, next slide, please. Um, so to recap, what are the problems with multi-stakeholderism and with this corporate capture of food systems? Firstly, it's the process. Um, this undermines principles of inclusivity, fairness, and transparency. Um, and particularly in fora like the UN Food Systems Summit, where there is an illusion of transparency and lots of language on transparency and inclusiveness. But in fact, what's happening is, is really undermining that. Um, the outcomes, uh, we see such poor outcomes on the SDGs. Uh, rising hunger globally, so many more, and that's clearly linked to the capture of our food system governance. Um, these outcomes, are, they're policy outcomes. It's also uh, the outcome of shaping narratives and shaping that broader regulatory climate in which policies are made. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we address these problems? Um, we don't need to start from scratch, and there are clearly some good precedents out there. 
Um, but we do need to go much, much further, and we need to take stock of some of the failures and shortcomings of, of the attempts that have been made so far to address um, corporate capture of food governance. Um, as mentioned before, there was a big push to rein in corporations in the 1970s. That waned in the subsequent decades, but in the 2000s, uh, we did see some renewed attempts. There was the UN Global Compact leading to the two 2011 UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. These are guiding principles, therefore limited in their scope to bring real liability for corporations, um, but they did bring some, some useful procedures and guidelines, and in some cases paved the way for some strong due diligence approaches to be taken. Um, there's been some progress on antitrust policies, renewed interest in that under the Biden administration in the US recently. Um, there's been progress in terms of transparency over lobbying. Um, for example, lobbying registers, more declaration of, of political donations, but that hasn't stopped the money coming in and leveraging influence, of course. And perhaps the last point here is the most important, and this is really a major ongoing opportunity. Uh, since 2014, under the Human Rights Council, there's been an open-ended working group um, trying to produce a binding UN treaty on transnational corporations and human rights. Uh, these efforts are ongoing, and they're bringing some really important concepts onto the table, including civil, criminal, and administrative liability for human rights abuses under international law. They're shifting discussion onto kind of binding state-imposed obligations via international and domestic law. Um, they're bringing discussion of remedy mechanisms for affected communities. And through these discussions, um, we've seen um, mining, agriculture, fish, health, tax justice movements come together with a common focus. And, uh, and we hope that can go further. Uh, next and final slide, please. So in our report, um, we really just scraped the surface of what needs to be done. Um, what needs to be done is to uh, essentially reimagine our approaches here reimagine food systems and structures of power. Um, and we've, we've identified kind of three key principles to guide that, but we're aware that there's so many, so much work to be done to really hone the specific approaches under each of these. Um, I think for the first principle here is about reining in the influence of corporations and really clipping their wings. And here there is some momentum. I mentioned this new antitrust climate. Um, there's been some great exposés of corporate capture and lobbying, which helps to inform the public. Um, and there is this, this work on a UN binding treaty, which can be taken forward. And in this report, we put forward the need for a, a UN-wide corporate accountability framework um, that can really establish clear principles of conflict of interest when it comes to food system government. And for this, we can draw on precedents. For example, the World Health Organization in its framework on tobacco has some good precedents on really setting clear criteria for corporate involvement and exclusion. Um, and within that, we need to be looking at checks covering whole businesses and the whole ecosystems of partners, funders, front groups that represent those interests. Alongside that, we need really fundamental steps to democratize decision making um, in existing spaces and really center civil society and affected communities in a gender setting. And finally, we also need to build and strengthen autonomous spaces and processes things like the Nialani Forum, the World Forum of Fishers Peoples, these spaces where we can be doing unconstrained strategizing and building a basis for future positions to be taken um, when interfacing with states and private sector in other governance fora. Um, very final slide, <laughs> just to leave on a note of hope. Um, here are some, some recent developments that really show that the tide may be starting to turn a bit. And perhaps the thing that's most hopeful is that through COVID and the food price crisis, the public is now fed up. They're fed up of greedflation, fed up of price gouging, food price, energy price rises, and that is creating a different climate for policymakers to work in. Um, and we hope that can go further. Thanks very much. Thank you, Nick for giving us that overview and historical context for how we got to where we're at today. With the panelists that I have up on stage, we're gonna talk more 
about the problems before we get to solutions, and we're gonna talk about specific regions and areas. And first I want to start with D. To talk a little bit more piggybacking on what Nick was talking about, the UN Food Systems Summit. This completely sidestepped the Committee on World Food Security initially, which is supposed to be the primary space for inclusive participatory decision-making on uh, hunger elimination and food security for all. So Dee, if you can help us understand how did that happen? Um, I think Nick really explained it, but I think what I should do is go a couple steps back and explain what the Committee on World Food Security is and how civil society and social movements um, participate in that. So the Committee on World Food Security, um, which is part of the Food and Agriculture um, Organization of the UN, um, was reformed in 2010, after that first crisis around food prices. And it includes different mechanisms. So there's a private sector mechanisms, member states, um, a philanthropy mechanism, and then the civil society and indigenous peoples mechanism. So it is a multilateral rather than a multi-stakeholder um, space. And the CSIPM, as we say, facilitates the participation of social movements, of any organizations working on food, farming, food insecurity, and the right to food. Because the UN is a space about human rights. And even though it's focused on the right to food, all human rights are indivisible. So we find that we also have women's organizations, youth organizations, but all centered around the right to food. So the CSIPM has 11 constituencies, um, smallholder farmers, pastoralists, fisher folk, indigenous peoples, agricultural and food workers, landless women, youth consumers, urban food insecure, and NGOs. Um, and then there are 17 regions. So I'm the Western Europe representative um, at the civil society and indigenous people's me mechanism. So we're organized around pluralism, autonomy, diversity, self-organization, um, and we try to articulate positions um, using consensus. So this space has been undermined by the UNFSS um, and continues to be undermined. Um, we are seeing a parallel development um, of systems happening um, so that it weakens the position. And as it currently stands, the CSIPM is being undermined within the system by lack of financial flow. So currently our secretariat cannot function um, because money that was given by the EU and several member states has just sat in IFAD since last February. So it means very people, um, the most food insecure and people who we center are unable to participate because there's no language justice. We provide um, sort of translation so that people can participate. You know, we bring people from around the world to participate in processes. And right now we cannot do that. Um, and even this 
past year at the plenary. Um, that was moved to make way for a week um, that came out of this UNFSS. You know, that has been a complete waste of time. Um, most of the member states um, can't see what has come out of it. Um, we've also seen the FAO come up with this roadmap um, that was presented at COP, but there's nothing sound. So, yeah, we have work to do. We have serious work to do to um, preserve the, the space to ensure that civil society can participate. Thank you. We'll come back to talk about uh, possible solutions or ways forward, um, but I want to ask Milian, in your work with AFSA for food sovereignty in Africa, what have been some of the trends that you've seen from the national to the local to, to the continental level in, um, in fights for food sovereignty and how have transnational corporations been stepping in? Have you seen any of the trends that, that Nick displayed up on the screen? Yeah, I just want to say from the outset is to lay the context that African life is based on agriculture. You know, in some countries, over 80% of the people uh, are involved in agriculture. If you include the whole of the food system, that percentage might even increase. So when we talk about governance and food sovereignty, we are talking about the largest section of the community. Second context is that it's largely disrupted. Africa is trying to find itself. And it's finding it, find, finding it difficult to find itself. Because it was destroyed, started slavery and colonialism. Before that, it's well recorded that there was an agricultural system, a functioning agricultural and economic system. So that destruction has continued post-independence in terms of governance. It has continued. It has continued because aid, you know, um, it's, 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 it's uh, statistical, it's recorded that, you know, the, uh, every year, much more money goes out of Africa than coming into Africa in the form of aid. I think twice. And uh, the, the, our governments are cash strapped because of debt and other issues. So there's always a need to bring more. So this has, this has trans shifted the, the governance to the outside bodies instead of Africans actually controlling their own, their own food system. And new actors have come in. One of the new actors, for example, is Gates, the Gates Foundation, Bill and Minda Gates Foundation. They came in 2006, and, they, and them and Rockefeller started the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa. So they put a lot of money in the certain African countries which were chosen to be, what do you call it, a guinea pig in terms of kind of experimenting, a green revolution kind of agriculture. We're happy because there's money coming in. Then what has happened? What has happened? They spectacularly failed in what they say they would succeed. No increased food production, um, there's no reduction of people in poverty, no reduction of malnutrition, you know, the main, the main, the main things. But they have succeeded in something else, which is changing our laws around seed, you know. Watering down the biosafety regulations. Even developing the strategy of some African countries, like the Kenyan agricultural, agricultural strategy and in the Ghanaian agricultural strategy. They, they've actually designed that agricultural, I mean, that, that, that strategy, agricultural strategy. So that's how influence comes into, into, into the system. And suddenly when we campaigned against AGRA, against AGRA 
and uh, 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 hammering Agra. They changed the name. They said, we are no more uh, Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa. We are Agra now, without the abbreviation. But another actor came in, which is the African Development Bank. Who owns the African Development Bank? People think that you know, the majority of the shareholders in African Development Bank are Africans. No? So the African Development Bank had a, a, a conference at the beginning of this year in February. And they say that they have, they have raised over 50 billion USD for uh, 40 compacts. These are agreements. If you look into these agreements, all of them are a green revolution agenda. So it is very difficult for our government to really govern their agenda. Now what's happening, the national level at the local level is because of the, the crisis, the two crises, you know, the three probably, the three C's, as I paid says, the, uh, the pandemic, you know, the COVID, COVID, Hashona, that, you know, Africa, while the rest of the world it is, you know, half of the rest of the world it is, I mean, vaccinated, only 1% or something, where Africans were vaccinated, we're left for our own. And everybody thinks that we'll die like flies, but it didn't happen. Then the war between, uh, the conflict between Ukraine and uh, Russia, the cost of everything has skyrocketed. Now, even the governments, when you talk to them, they, they think that, you know, ah, probably that food sovereignty agenda is a very important agenda. But how do they understand food sovereignty? If food sovereignty, according to African Development Bank, is producing your own artificial fertilizers, hopefully your own, G your own GMOs, and hopefully your own hybrids, you know? It's not this fundamental concepts of food, food sovereignty. You see? So we have, to, we have to be careful. We are not still there, but we are fighting and we are making inroads. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, really difficult when the same terms are being used to mean very different things. <laughs> um, Nikki, if we can come to the local context here in the UK. When farmers are transitioning to agroecological farming, which is farming with nature, but also based on social justice, based on participatory decision making, what kind of challenges do they face here in the local context? So I, I'm really going to, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. I'm going to really zoom us in <laughs> to very specific UK-focused farming um, within, within my response. So um, my, my research has been particularly over the last two years looking at that agroecological transition and what, what role um, particularly does nature connectedness play in that. But this is through the lens of um, leverage points for transformation that was set out by Dave Abson and others, and this kind of draws on the work of Donna Meadows, um, who's a great systems thinker, um, particularly um, prevalent in the 1970s. And that um, lens, if you like, asks us to think of, of three different approaches to, to enable transition. One is that we rethink the way that we learn so that we support peer-led, bottom-up knowledge exchange as opposed to top-down knowledge transfer. Um, that we reconnect with nature and natural systems, which is an underpinning core concept of agroecology, as you, as you pointed out, Nicole, um, and that we restructure governance and that we democratise and reconsider the way that we make decisions and that we distribute power within our food system. And um, of all the farmers that I talked to um, throughout the last two years, um, both through my, my PhD research, but also the wider work that I do around um, supporting farmers in the UK, particularly livestock farmers, almost all of them are acting despite a lack of appropriate governance as opposed to because of. So at the moment, what we're seeing is an agroecological transition within the UK that is in spite of the frameworks that we, we require, um, that is happening from a grassroots level, from the ground up, but it is really challenged and held back because of output market dependency. So this is a huge issue that was brilliantly articulated by Elizabeth Vach through some work that was done 
um, in, in Scottish Highlands that basically said, what is preventing this transition in Scotland towards an agroecological food future, food and farming future? And the biggest challenge that she identified was that we have this market dependency on outputs. And that's where the control is really kind of creating a pinch point for many farmers in the UK. It doesn't matter how much work farmers are doing on the ground to enable um, and to kind of harness natural processes or to reduce their inputs or to create more opportunity for um, a regenerative soil focused farm system. If the output, the market dependency on outputs is the limiting factor, it will significantly um, challenge our ability to have a truly agroecological future. And I think that that is, for me, the biggest concern and for many farmers. And it's definitely something that I would say many, particularly livestock farmers, don't always feel able to articulate, but they recognise it's an issue. So a very, very specific example. In Scotland, we have Scotch beef. So as long as it is born, raised, slaughtered in Scotland, it can be called Scotch beef. It doesn't have to be a hairy highland coo on a hill, which is often what is used in the marketing. Um, but it could be any sort of animal uh, that, it, you know, that is born, lived in Scotland, slaughtered in Scotland, um, and that can be called Scotch beef. And it can, never has to go outside. It can live in a shed all its life, um, for example. Um, and that, that whole process which is governed by food assurance systems through Quality Meat Scotland. And this isn't a dig at them because it's driven by ultimately the oligopolistic supermarket structures that we have to deal with, but is calling for consistency over quality, is calling for a consistent product that meets a market spec that is the same size, shape, etc., for those steaks to go through a packing system that is most appropriate for um, a more industrialised processing a part of the system as opposed to what is good for... Um, human health, what might be good to taste, what might be nutritious. And it doesn't matter what the farmers are doing in that kind of production system, if the requirement at the end point is a particular output, there is only so much shift that can happen. Um, and so we've been really working through Pasture for Life, particularly in Scotland, to try and disrupt that to some extent. And what we find, and that we, we know we see across other sectors as well, not just livestock, is that the, the burden the weight of the additional parts of that food system that we take on board as producers to try and create fairness and, and, and parity is disproportionate to the benefits that we get. So we not only have to be farmers and producers, we have to be salespeople, we have to be processors, we have to be um, social media experts, we have to be really good at customer service. Um, we also have to be able to be great accountants. We have to be able to become logistics operators. We are, it's an unfair burden to ask farmers to always hold um, and to carry in order to be more agroecological. And for me, that's the challenge, is that how do we really support farmers to work more in cooperation, to work in collaboration, and bring in other actors to do this for us, but that aren't taking the corporate power, as we have seen so far, particularly through supermarkets. So there's some really nice examples, right? So like Hodmidods, Wild Farmed, Primal Meats, they're all doing a really important role of kind of processing, taking that product, making it accessible into the market, which is shifting this output dependency that has been um, a real limiting factor. So more of that, I think, is what we need to see, but it can't always be the job of the farmer to drive that. To be blunt, we're knackered. We've been working really hard at this for a long time. <laughs> We're really tired of having to fulfill the rest of the food chain's responsibility. I think what we need is to see more NGOs, more organisations, actually, rather than trying to get farmers to constantly change what they're doing, to be creating and filling that gap for what we really need, which is that processing capacity and power. Okay. St sticking with you for just a little bit long. Oh, did you want to hop in? Oh, no. <laughs> About this meant. I have something to say. Um, are there places where it has been easier to participate? Um, are there spaces of collaboration that you can point to that are really inspiring cases? 
Yeah, definitely. There's some really fantastic examples, and I think that they are across all different types of production, particularly in the UK, um, which is where a lot of my work is, is focused. So I'm sorry for bringing a very UK lens to this. But um, I would say that, so for example, for Pasture for Life, who I work for, um, we've been really, really working hard to create an appropriate supply chain to help farmers get 100% um, pasture-fed ruminant meat and dairy products into um, people like Riverford, for example. So being able to access um, people, you know, anyone in the city, for example, who is, doesn't necessarily have a local producer can access that through those other, those other markets. Um, we've also, as I said, like with Wild Farmed, Hodmid Dodds, there's some really nice examples there. My personal issue with a lot of that, it's very middle class and it's all quite expensive. Um, there's a real challenge around how we actually make this food accessible to everybody, not just to those who can afford it. And again, that weight then is put back on the producer. So for example, I sell 100% pasture fed beef. I try and price match as much as I can to the supermarket um, to make sure that food is accessible. We work with a local food hub to try and make sure that everybody has access to our, to our produce, but we sell it all frozen, which kind of requires that people have access to freezers in order to be able to, to buy it and store it. So there's all these broader issues and challenges that, again, the farmer is the one that's having to kind of carry that weight. Sorry, you asked for positive things, and I'm coming back to my moan. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's built in at this point. Um, but yeah, there are, there are some really, really great examples out there. I have cited a few already. We need more of that. And we need to be less afraid of cooperatives. There's some really good cooperatives. In Scotland, we have a lot more cooperative action than we do in England, for example. I think we could learn a lot from the French model of cooperatives. There are many, many opportunities out there. We're still very much in a collective mindset of competition over collaboration. And the powers that be are enabling that and forcing that and causing that. And that's the thing that needs to break. It's the mindset of collaborating rather than competing that I think more of us need to find confidence in and have faith in and find ways that it's actually working. Thanks. So, Milion, coming back to you, you said that farmers and governments are really dealing with running up against big power and big money in Africa. How, how do smallholder farmers um, fight against this, this normalization of the Green Revolution as the transformation that's needed in Africa? What, what kind of um, spaces, maybe, or movements can we take inspiration from here uh, in this local context and in other regions of the world? Yeah, I think uh, a lot is happening in Africa. Uh, what we are trying to do uh, is also somehow, you know, there are a lot of uh, dots. You know, it's very much important to bring those dots mm. to, to, to a coherent and a larger kind of story and, and voice. And that's happening. That's happening usually in Africa. Just to give you uh, an example in Kenya, for example, at the local level, uh, Kenya is divided into 37 counties. Uh, one of the counties, which is called uh, Mirunga, because of the advocacy, the activism of uh, the, the Kenyans, um, members of AFSA and other civil society organizations, has produced an agroecology policy. Another county called Vihiga is also following. And there are three others following, you see, from, from the ground. So that's happening and uh, it's driven by farmers. I must say that uh, research is also helping, you know, the, the, the comparison of uh, agroecological farming and um, conventional forms of far farming, that result is also helping this change in, in Kenya. In Uganda, the Ugandan government was one of the governments who supported agroecology to be part of the climate policy of Uganda. You see? So that, that initiative was very much important for us because it, they are pushing the African group of negotiators to recognize agroecology in climate agriculture discussion. And we have worked with the Ugandan government to do that. And that is the same with the Zambian government, the Togolese, to some extent to the Senegalese uh, government, even the Ethiopian government recognizes agroecology. Now they are developing a strategy. So a number of governments are developing a strategy. I must mention uh, the Agroecology Coalition 
Here also there are a number of African countries who are members of that, that coalition. Uh, we are making them accountable to that. You are a member, so what are you doing about it, you know? So that's also to some extent uh, very much uh, helpful. Um, the African Union is uh, producing a very uh, coarse and funny um, policy, which they call biotechnology and farmers management system. We, in advance of the, uh, the African Union, the farmers in AFSA have produced uh, a farmers management system framework, which is basically allowing us, allowing our farmers to grow, um, exchange, and sell their own seeds because of the seed legislation that is coming from, uh, that is recommended by so many, including Agra, you know, uh, under the OPO of 91, you know, the international structure would actually force farmers to buy seeds from, from seed producers, you know? So, uh, so we have produced that framework. We want to separate the two, the biotechnology, the seed agenda, and we are ma making advances. Uh, we have started a, a project or a program or a campaign, which is called My Food is African. And uh, one arm is a food policy. That food policy, actually, we started it with, uh, with the I International Panel of Experts on the Sustainability of Food, IPS Food, IPS, uh, you know, successfully um, introduced the food policy in Europe. So in Africa, for the last uh, four years, we have been working on it. And this year, it was presented on the table at the African Union. And uh, we are advancing quite a lot around that. So the campaign is partly that partly a number of uh, uh, celebrations all over Africa. So there is a lot happening in Africa around the seed and uh, <coughs> agroecology and food sovereignty agenda. And our role is just, just to bring all those dots together and uh, bring all the actors together and in advance. Great. I have lots of follow-up questions, but I'm hoping some <laughs> of you in the audience will ask Million because I have to move on. Uh, and so what I'm hearing is we need, we have so many inspiring examples, but sometimes they're scattered and we need to bring them together. We need to get people to learn from each other and collaborate. Uh, I wonder if Dee, you can also point to some wins in food sovereignty movements or, or food justice movements and how those were achieved. Um, we definitely have really big wins in the movements, but to build on something that Nikki said, you know, we're tired, but we can't afford to be weary because this work is slow and long work. Um, it has taken decades to get the UNDROP, um, the UN Declaration on Rights of Peasants, likewise the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, the recent um, social solidarity, um, so a statement at the UN General Assembly. Um, so these things take time, literally they take decades. Um, but we also have smaller wins at the CFS um, where we've been participating since 2010 um, and influenced the policy there. Even though most of what comes out of there is voluntary, they do trickle down, um, not just to national level, but to local level. And the CFS recognizes that and is trying to get more local governments involved in this participatory um, policy making. So most recent um, would be the voluntary guidelines on data, um, also the voluntary guidelines on women and um, gender empowerment. And in fact, that one was a very long one. Um, it came from the CSIPM um, and it's taken about seven years um, for, to get those voluntary guidelines through. It was really physically and emotionally draining, right? But within that, 
we forged connections globally. Um, we forged connections with different parts of the UN system. So it is about that cooperation, that collaboration, because I think we need to understand our food system isn't just about supply chain. Supply chain is what market focuses on that. Um, capitalist, market-driven um, policy making is what the corporations do. We do holistic policy making um, that encompasses everything and is seeking to uproot and dismantle all those systems of oppression. That means that people are in poverty, that means our farmers are in poverty, and that means that so many millions of people cannot eat, right? That is the work we are doing and we cannot afford to get weary. So I have a final round of questions for each of you to talk a little bit about what more needs to be done, and then we'll transition to taking questions from the audience. And I'll start with Nikki first. You said that it's, it's been an uphill battle for, for farmers in transitions to agroecology here in the UK to, to participate in decision-making spaces. So what more needs to be done to allow for that, to facilitate, let's say, authentic participation? I would really like to see alternatives so that rather than having to keep battling to have access to the places where decisions are currently made, let's create our own alternative decision-making places. But it shouldn't be the farmers that are making that happen. Like, we don't have time to organise that. What we need are other players, other actors within the sector to start stepping into those roles. I think there are too many people who probably recognise that this needs to happen, but they're either not brave enough um, to take that step into doing that, or they kind of feel like it's not their role. But some of, somebody has to step into that role and say, do you know what, we are going to be the people that are creating the, the opportunity for development of frameworks for collaboration, frameworks for cooperation. Actually, we're just going to do some heavy lifting and we are going to create an alternative supply chain that is participatory, that does support accessibility regardless of your scale so whether you're producing um you know you've got a market garden that's one hectare or whether you're growing field scale veg whether you are producing a small amount of milk or whether you're producing thousands of liters a year let's not say that you can only participate if you're at a small scale let's try and do what helen was saying this morning earlier about opening our arms and encouraging people to be involved because actually for those who are working at a larger scale Often the thing that prevents them from that shift is the ability to find an alternative market so that they have the headspace, they have the opportunity to shift what they're doing. We, you know, I keep saying this, but we don't have the capacity, we don't have the headspace as producers. We need other people to step into this space for us, um, whether that's existing actors or whether that's people creating new opportunities. But what we need to make sure is that we hold whoever may come in to do that to account so it doesn't become yet another talking shop that says, here's a report telling everyone what we need. What we actually need is action. We need to make sure that those frameworks, those systems are put in place and that are designed by those within the system that can help to create that, but who don't necessarily have to put all their own time and energy into producing those frameworks and systems. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> and Milian, for AFSA, what can we look forward to in the future? You've described so many wins, but what are you focusing on now? Oh, so many things. <laughs> um, I, will, I will talk... Uh, a little bit about three of them, and if I have time, I'll, talk, I'll add one of them. I think uh, one thing that we are realizing that we have to bring a young generation, uh, bring them up or whatever. I think we, uh, we have organized, uh, at the beginning of this year, May, actually, uh, a meeting of the youth, youth movements in Africa. So 70 of them came. I mean, we took them with certain principles of uh, agroecology. They loved it, you know? So at that meeting, we decided that next year, means, meaning this year, we have to organize a huge event, a thousand youth summit. So in October, they came. So they have defined the objective, the themes, 
you know, detailed uh, their sub themes, and uh, they have they have developed the, the, uh, the roadmap and launched it at the COP. So one thing that excites me is the preparation in the organization of that meeting, and we have decided it's, it will be in October, between the 13th and the, the 16th of October, and it has to be, pay, I mean, focused on solution. African youth solution for Africa. So that is one of the most important activity. Second is at AFSA, I think um, a year ago, we have asked ourselves, how can we use the force of the market to support the transition to agroecology? What shall we do? So we organized a big conference uh, last year, in, in May last year, and after that a program has come out, which we have started now in six African countries, African agroecological entrepreneurs. <coughs> Are there African agricultural entrepreneurs? And uh, what is the volume of the trade? Do they get support? Is there a policy support for them? We did that study. We, and, and similarly, in, in parallel, we have also started to study uh, the, um, the territorial markets in Africa. Very critical markets, these are small markets. So we did study, we mapped some of them, and we understood the, the challenge. There is a very, very strong relationship between territorial markets, food sovereignty, and agroecology. We need to focus on that. Mm -hmm. So that is one body of work. Um, and also there is another one which is called healthy soil and healthy food. This is a practical side of agroecology. There are a, a number of methods that we can build our, our, uh, our soil and we can grow uh, healthy food, we can increase productivity and build resilience into the system. And this is practiced in 10, 21 African countries now. So we are continuing that, we'll, we'll, we'll continue doing that. The My Food is African campaign is a very, very critical campaign. During COVID, when everything was closed, people could see that you know, they can eat their own food and that they can survive. And now through agroecology, they can grow their own food and they can survive. I live in, I come from Ethiopia where there's diverse food, as you know. In Uganda, I know the, the diversity of food in Uganda is astounding. I, I was in Cameroon, um, also in, in uh, Senegal. Each African country has diverse food. We need, to, we need to bring them up and that's where the food sovereignty comes from. And we need to work for uh, policy supports it. So that's our agenda for next year. Thank you. So Dee, coming back to the CFS and the, the civil society and indigenous peoples mechanism, which you've described how much it's been undermined and, and the financial flows moving away from it. So what needs to be done? How can it be strengthened? Um, so, the vision is for a truly democratic food governance. And when we say democratic, this is not about party politics. This is, this is about people power. That's what democratic means. If you go back to the Latin and Greek roots of it, it means demos, the people, and pratic power, right? So we are talking about people power, right? We need to overcome the various barriers that have been put in place, um, and we do need to collaborate. We need more participation, stronger participation, right? We need to be able to show up um, we need to be funded. We can't just depend on state funding, even though it is their responsibility to do that, right? This is where some of our philanthropists can support the social movements and people most impacted. And we need to be building from the ground, not top down, from the ground. So what Nikki is asking for, um, it's like Conseil in Brazil, 
um, here in the UK, we're starting a civil society forum to bring people together, right? Bring people together around that right to food so that farmers aren't doing the heavy lifting. This is an intersectional battle and we need everyone to participate in uprooting the economic um, sort of barriers, right, to overcome debt, um, to ov overcome the legacies of colonization um, and, and slavery. Um, and the, the, these aren't just words, right? They are mechanism. And it starts with having conversations. Everything that you see happening here today came out of conversations, right? We need to listen to each other and then we need to act. Small steps turn into big steps, right? But we need to build that people power in places where the corporations are, right? And we also need to take action in terms of weakening the power of corporations. So the trade, we need to look at trade, we need to look at um, legislation um, to reduce that um, power that corporations have. Our governments have a role in that. They suppo they're supposed to be representing us and not in corporations. Right? And I know a lot of us have lost faith in government, but unless we vote, unless we participate, nothing will change. And it starts from local and goes up. Yeah. I would like to ask Nick to come back up on stage and now we'll open it up for questions from the audience uh, in case you have questions for Nick or Dee, Nikki or Milian. We have one microphone here in the orange vest and another one in the back. And I'd like to take a couple of questions from the floor here and a couple of questions from our online participants as well. So whoever would like to, I see a hand here with, in the black on the left and then there in the white. Shall I go? Thank yes, you very please. much. Uh, my name's Henry. Um, I was wondering if people had considered the potential of local currencies to create mm. parallel food economies that could be subject to democratic governance and ensure food justice uh, in the system too. Thank you. And then I'll just take a couple of questions and then we'll ask the, the panelists to answer in the white. Go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Eve Gleason from Share Action. Um, I just had a question about sort of working from the bottom up. Obviously, a lot of the power structures that we're working against are very top down, whether we're talking about governments or, or corporations or financial institutions. And I was wondering if you think there was any capacity for some of those power structures to somehow collaborate with affected communities or if that's sort of going down a road that, that has really no potential because of some of the corruption um, and greed and, and, um, and, and toxic lobbying practices that we're seeing in those structures. Okay, so the first question on local currencies and the second is about working with the power structures that exist already, okay. Um, could we actually get a couple of questions from online as well? If there's a microphone that can come up here, we have a couple of questions online as well. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so the first question comes from Georgie Hurst, and it says, do you see a way forward where multi-stakeholderism multi can be conducted while centering justice? And then the second question comes from Adrian Joy Farms, who said that this is such a great talk, giving me a lot to think about. And then, is the overriding subject 
which has driven corporate growth, uh, the problem of how we value food, and the race to the bottom driven by main retailers. Um, so if I understand it correctly, the question is whether uh, the way we value food and the behavior of main retailers um, creates the, the, the main problems we've been talking about. Mm, okay. So these are the two questions. Okay, I'm going to take these four questions first and then we'll come back for another round. Uh, so there was the question on local currencies to create parallel food economies. Working within the existing power structures, how to do so? Uh, the third question on multi-stakeholderism with justice. Is that possible? And the fourth, how we value food and if that is the root of many of these pro problems. And you don't have to answer them all if there's one that particularly, um, yeah, that you're called to, to answer, please. Yeah, I don't mind going first. Sure. Okay. Um, local currencies, short answer, no. I haven't considered that. That's an interesting one. Um, my, I guess my gut reaction to that is that it might be a bit of a um, distraction to try and create the capacity and the space and the ability to do that. But, I mean, you could... Just, I suppose barter is a really nice example of where that is working and there's some lovely examples, very local examples of kind of barter shops and exchange opportunities. So I guess in some ways that is, um, that is re reflected in those and that seems to be working well, but again, it's on a very localised basis. I, um, there's obviously has potential to be scaled out. Um, I think that question around the capacity for collaboration with those who are currently holding the power with communities is a really fascinating one. Um, and it also was bringing to mind, you know, I'd, I've said maybe something to ask for that we need collectively as producers particularly is this kind of another actor coming in and kind of creating an alternative. Um, and the risk there is that that, that, that organisation, those organisations, that those actors taste the power, they like it, <laughs> and then they basically morph into those that we have concerns with already. So I think that there is something about, I'm not, I'm not convinced that the collaboration with existing power structures is the way forward because I think there will always be an underpinning um, agenda for growth that's driven by capitalism which is going to be problematic. Um, I think that an alternative that has strong governance, participatory governance with frameworks that enable um, those organisations to be held to account for example to ensure that there is never a scaling up, only ever a scaling out. I think I would be much more comfortable putting energy and time into alternatives to existing power structures than to trying to develop collaborations with those who I think probably are lacking in trust. Like it's not a good starting point for a relationship already. So trying to fix that, for me, I'm not sure that for, as producers, we kind of have patience for that. We're probably looking for something new, both for our own, um, I guess, peace of mind, but also that are created within structures that prevent the morphing of those into those power structures that we, that we also already find problematic. Yeah. Um, working with power. Can we differ? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not even sure I'm right in what I said. No, 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 no it's fine. Like, really I think I agree with you. Which, which kind of, I think it's contextual. Yeah. Mm. Uh, what kind of power is also a question. If you're asking me we have, whether we need to work with our governments, for example, that's the only way to some extent. Mm. Uh, because if we want to bring change at a bigger scale, we need to work with government. We, can, we cannot bring change at a bigger scale and systemic change, especially at the local level, mm. local governments. One, we cannot work without their knowledge. In our context in Africa, there's no way that we work against the government. Uh, we do work with against government in a, in, a, in a very strategic way. But I personally found out that you can, uh, through training and, and um, a lot of, a lot of uh, relationship creating with the local government, because they see us as an enemy. Oh, any Joe, civil society, enemy. So, and among governments, but especially individually, there is, you can create a lot of rapport. Yes. So in that case, then you, you need to work with power. But there is a danger into, into that also, because they can easily be co-opted into power. 
you know, if you want to work with corporations, you know, corporate interests and whatever, you can easily be co-opted. You can, you can, you can um, easily uh, support their agenda. So it's, 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 a, it's, it's a very fluid environment, but we need, it's contextual, so we need to consider where we're working. Um, I'll take the question on local um, currencies, and I think they have a really important role to play um, to expand about the UN General Assembly on social and solidarity economy. Um, it isn't just about food, it's about communities, it's about land, water, seeds, um, energy. Um, so currency has a really important role to pay in that. Um, the UK government has voted um, on this, so they have to bring it into any sort of national um, legislation. Um, this also includes agroecology, and there's a framework um, to work from. So our work um, as activists, as um, people, right, is to encourage our governments to build on these, to be courageous. Because I think what is lacking is political will. Right? Because they're, they're so embedded with the corporations. Right? But they need to be courageous. Right? And that is our work. Right? To encourage them to be courageous. Right? To encourage them to step out of that box and to center people and to center justice and to do what is right as a government, right? They have a responsibility to us and we need to continually remind them about that. Nick. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if I could come back very briefly on the question of um, how we value food um, and the role of mainstream retail. I agree, I think this is absolutely central to all of this. The kind of the cheap food economy, the low cost food system model that we have, that's the reason why we have these mega corporations. It's the only thing they really do well, is driving down the, co the costs of food. It's the reason why these mergers are waved through, because they say, well, we can deliver um, low prices for consumers. It's the reason why they retain that power. Uh, so if we want to get away from that, then we do need to challenge that, that cheap food model and, and be talking about true costs. Yes. Okay, we can take more questions now. So they're in this purple vest here and in the very back there as well. And more online. Okay, great. So we'll start here in the purple vest. Hello, uh, three uh, points, if I may. I'll be as quick as possible. Fiona Morrison, uh, Scottish Rural Action and also a crofter from the Hebrides in Scotland. Um, I think in Scotland, just building on what Nikki was saying, we have the Good Food Nation Bill, which is being developed in terms of a plan by the Scottish Food Coalition. Some of the key things which I think we could learn from that, it's still to be imp implemented but is local procurement, which aligns with circular economy and closed loop production. But it means that if you have local procurement for schools, hospitals, prisons, hotels, anything, mm -hmm. then we know that producers will produce food if they had a local market which was guaranteed. They are just trying to make a living along with anybody else. And they have been sucked into this capitalist model. But if under provenance of food, there was local procurement to supply your community and these big organizations, then that would give them a source of income. The other thing I think we need to look at is the research model. We had uh, people looking at food security in the Outer Hebrides funded five universities, including this one, three universities in England, two in Scotland, who told us that in my islands, we were vulnerable because we didn't have the big supermarkets. 
So I said, I don't think so. You know, you have to go to a cross-party meeting to tell them that you don't think you're vulnerable and that who is measuring the increase in the food that we are all interested in that is sold from the farm gate, which Nikki is selling and many of you in this room. This is real food and we are not measuring this and we are not tracking it. So we cannot demonstrate how it is feeding people in a much more positive way than what the supermarket model is. Uh, and maybe I'll leave it there just now. I've taken enough time, but I just think, you know, these are things we can be thinking about. Thank you. Yes. Please. Um, a really fascinating conversation this morning, so thank you to all the speakers. My name's Liz Bowles. I'm, I'm the chief exec of the Farm Carbon Toolkit, but I've worked all my career in agriculture and in local food. And I have to say, I really empathize with you, Dee, about saying you're exhausted from the kind of the fight over the last 20, 30 years, really. And what I wanted to say was a bit of a comment and then a question to all the um, speakers. And it's to do with power in the supply chains. I was listening on the way up. Um, I should also say I'm a farmer in deepest, darkest Devon farming sheep. Um, I was listening to the farming program on the way up this morning and a report at the other Oxford conference was asking the question, are our food supply chains broken? And the author was saying that when food is in short supply, suddenly producers have power. And he was talking about um, the egg situation a year ago. I've also done quite a lot of research into this sort of power within supply chains. And the only real way for producers to get power is either to go independently to market or to be in a position where what they're producing is in short supply. Now, neither of those is of itself the answer, I don't think. But the thing that I wanted to sort of bring into the conversation at this session is how producers work with people who eat food, i.e. everybody. And I think that's something that hasn't really been brought to the fore. And calling on government to suddenly change, I found that to be quite problematical in my career. But where I have seen change happen, and actually it's really the, probably the most encouraging thing during my career, is more and more people actually want to know where their foods come from and want to work with those people producing food. So I guess my question to all the delegates is how can we accelerate that in order that it builds power within those more, um, well, call them fragmented supply chains or really through small hubs rather than through national and international supply chains. Thank you. Okay. I think we can take one question from online only, and then we'll take this round of three questions. Is it? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, okay, so first apologies to people online. A lot of the questions did not come through before. Um, but just to be quick, um, we received a question about how someone is actively trying to do what Nikki described, building community structures to support good farming. But the hardest part so far has been actually engaging with farmers. And what would advice Nikki give um, to people doing this work? And as a follow-up, um, are there lists being compiled of projects which are leading a cooperative approach to food? And if so, how can we join up better? So yeah, thank you. Okay, so the first question, we, we looked at the Scotland Good Food Nation bill and local procurement and also, I think, related to territorial markets. The second question also about supply chains, power in supply chains, connecting producers and consumers, I feel is related to this local kind of food hubs. Um, so I wonder, maybe, Million, you've got something to say about territorial markets, how you're approaching this with AFSA. And then the last question about, was directed at Nikki, um, how to engage with farmers, how to get farmers to engage. Yeah, um, I think the local procurement is really, really exciting. It works. Uh, one example that we use uh, quite frequently is uh, leafy, the story of leafy vegetables in Kenya. You know, the Kenyan traditional healers, 
traditional people started to talk about the healing impacts of their, their leafy vegetables. Suddenly the demand for leafy vegetables has started to increase. And supermarkets started to hold, you know, leafy vegetables and farmers start to produce. And uh, I think I don't remember the name of the school, but one school actually started to procure from local communities, this is leafy vegetables. So the demand from consumers can actually stimulate production. And this is right. So we really need to work, to work on educating local people. So the, the territorial markets are very much important. By the way, these are spiritual, cultural, uh, economic, um, and in social spaces. They, are, they, do, they look disorganized, but they're very, very much organized. Um, and they have leaders, even. Uh, so, so focusing on territorial markets is also focus, focusing on circular economy. It's, it should be part of the narrative of circular economy. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Um, yeah, so just to answer directly the question about engaging with farmers and advice for engaging with farmers, I would suggest if you identify what that product is. So, for example, if it's a livestock product, then come and talk to Pasture for Life. We'll happily have a conversation with you and support your engagement with farmers. And I would suggest that if, if there's somebody who's looking to create an alternative market, for example, for, um, for vegetables produced in market gardens, then the Land Workers Alliance would be a fantastic place to go who would be able to, to put you directly in touch with, with growers. So there are organisations out there who already have a strong membership that definitely would be interested. So that would be would be my advice um, on that. I do just want to touch on the point about um, Liz raised with um, producers working with people who eat food and we have this real disconnect between understanding who the customer is and who the consumer is. They're not always the same people. I'm really privileged. My customers and the consumers are the same people. But as I said earlier, you know, it's exhausting being, being a producer that has customers and consumers. We definitely do need these kind of third party organizations to come in, but within an established government governance system that prevents them from scaling up and only supports them to scale out. Um, and that needs to be done in a way that is not kind of, I don't know, I think they're kind of, if we focus that around things like food hubs and community kitchens, it, it risks the, those things are really important but it risks their ability actually to scale out and to, to have impact at a level that we need them to. And I think trying to create something that, you know, it's this, this um, the, the kind of niche paradox. We, want, we kind of want to disguise this alternative so it kind of looks a little bit like a supermarket, so it's not too terrifying, but it actually has a governance structure that is much more supportive of the producer rather than corporate shareholders. So it's finding a balance that makes something look a little bit like what people are used to, but actually serves the interests of the people for whom it should be serving, not those who are um, you know, disparate corporations, for example. Thank you. And just a couple of final words, because we have to wrap it up from Dee, final words, and then Nick, final words. Yeah. So, you know, to take on board what Nikki is saying, you know, we have so many examples globally, um, you know, CSAs, community supported agriculture or local and solidarity partnerships. It is about co-creation, co-production. It's not the farmer serving a community, right? The farmer is part of your community, yeah. right? And we need to be creating models, and I refuse to use alternatives, right? Because this is what existed before, right? So we are reclaiming our ways of eating food, sharing food, growing food, um, distributing food. It is a reclamation. I, and that is where our power lies. Nick. Yeah, I just add that um, the, the climate, the policy climate, the regulatory climate, it can shift. And going back to one of those first slides with the, with the timeline, the 1970s was an opportunity. There was another one with COVID, where suddenly there were different policy options on the table and people talking about short supply chains again. These, these opportunities come and go quite fast. 
Uh, we just have to be ready for them. And in the meantime, we have to persevere. We have, we've already been patient. We have to be even more patient, keep participating um, in processes and spaces like CFS, um, keep bringing very relevant uh, demands, keep building support around them in the movements, um, because moments will come where they are listened to. Great. Yeah. Great. I would like to thank all of you for joining us today and those of you online as well. I'd like to thank all of the speakers, Dee, Million, Nikki, and Nick, the conference organizers. Thank you so much. And uh, the Land Workers Alliance and the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa who co-organized this event. And I'm very pleased and grateful that this is one of the first events of this conference. So I hope that you can take this energy with you, the learnings that you have brought here to build that people, people power that we need for a more just and ecological food system. Thank you.